Hello and welcome and happy new year, everybody. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Data Diversity. We would like you to, to thank you for joining the most recent webinar and the first webinar of the 2024 season in the Data Diversity Monthly Series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. The series is held the first Thursday of every month. And today, Wendy will be joined by Laura Sebastian Coleman, Mark Horseman, and Nicole Luke to discuss a fresh look at data literacy. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you can click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those panels. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our guest speakers. Laura Sebastian Coleman is the Vice President of Data Management and Governance at Prudential Financial and has worked in data management since 2003. She has implemented data quality metrics and reporting, established data consumer training programs, and led working groups to establish data standards in support of strategic data governance goals. Author of Navigating the Labyrinth, an Executive Guide to Data Management in 2018 and Measuring Data Quality for Ongoing Improvement in 2013, and meeting the challenges of data quality management in 2022. She is currently writing a data quality management textbook for the Insurance Data Management Association. Very cool. Nicole is the founder and president of Signific at B2B, a B2B company that provides analytics and project management solutions. With a solid foundation in statistics, Nicole has over 25 years of experience in data and analytics. Nicole has worked with companies of all sizes and has the ability to distill complex concepts into accessible insights. This has not only enhanced the, the data literacy of those she has directly worked with, but has also contributed to a broader cultural shift towards data-informed decision-making. Mark is a data, a data management professional and CDMP practitioner with over 20 years of experience and is a data evangelist at Dataversity. Mark moved into data quality, master data management, and data governance early in his career and has been working extensively in data management since the early 2000s. Previous to his work at Dataversity, Mark led information management initiatives in both private and public sector organizations. And let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value as a sense maker and analytic translator, a talented researcher and consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies, startups, and healthcare giants. Her own work has focused on the application of big data solutions in health and human capital management. Author of books on effective communication and analytics, Dr. Wendy has pioneered the only structured system to empower a new generation of professionals who will revolutionize the success the successful application of data to solve business challenges. These trained analytic translators allow companies to convert analytics, advanced analytics into actionable solutions, building a sustainable alliance between analytic and business professionals. I need to warm up my tongue this year, y'all. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to start her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hey there, Wendy. Thank you, Shannon. And I thought you did just technical this group is. I am here. I I am here. I am here. I can hear you now. Yeah. Can you hear me now? You're good. We sure can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. I know. Well, I know. I you need to warm up your tongue. I need to warm up my microphone. I guess. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us here this first week of 2024, especially my. Uh, esteemed panel members. And uh, for those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. Those of you who are coming the first time, welcome. And um, I appreciate you spending some of this first week of the year with us. So I'm going to start with just a little reminder about what we're focused on when we think about data literacy. And what I have to always remind myself when I get buried in a particular topic, whether that be analytic translation or whether that be data literacy, I have to remind myself that in the business world, not the academic world, not where we're focused on the theoretical, in the business world, business leaders do not want machine learning experts, 
they do not want comprehensive data governance. Business leaders do not want optimal data architecture. They do not want employees with high data literacy. Now, what do I mean by that? They don't want these things in and of themselves. They don't really care. I mean, not in a mean way, but on an, any given day, they don't really care about these things. What they want is to achieve measurable value from timely informed use of data. If they want to apply data in their organization, that is what they want. They don't want to have to think about it. They don't want to have to worry about it. They want it to be happening. And so business leaders, business executives will support the abilities and tools that will accelerate their ability here to achieve measurable value from timely informed use of data. And they will essentially tolerate these other things. They will accept that we need to develop better AI and machine learning capabilities, that we need to have consistent governance, that we need to have optimal architecture that makes things seamless and usable and safe. They are willing to accept having data literacy as a priority in training only, and I repeat, only if that enhances our ability to accelerate achieving measurable value from timely informed use of data. So when we look at these kinds of issues, and specifically in this series, we look at data literacy, we can't be assuming that data literacy is the end all be all. Even though many of us focus there and spend a lot of our careers focused there or spend a lot of our days focused there, it is only a value to the organization if it is helping us achieve measurable value from timely informed use of data, are we able to extract the insights that actually make the business better? So business leaders don't really want data literacy. They only want elements of what we can achieve if it produces value to the business. So and so as shopping. we answer these questions today, I want to have in the front of our mind, oh, oh I, I'm hoping that I can just quickly get through this then. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can keep in mind the questions, have we shown whether or not Number one, can we increase data literacy? Number two, can we increase data literacy by enough that it makes a difference? Can we increase data literacy for enough of our population that it makes a difference in such a way that it measurably increases value? So this is where we will focus today. We want to understand how we are doing and what will have to happen in the new year so that we can advance measurable value from timely informed use of data and what has to happen in order for data literacy to be a part of that. So Shannon, can you um, confirm that I'm still live right now? You are, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so I have a series of questions for our panelists. And the first one, just to get us all warmed up, was I wanted to know if data literacy has a theme song for 2024, what should that theme song be and why? And I'm going to go in order from left to right here. 
show if you want to cue your answer up. Um, Mark, tell us. Tell us. Uh, what should so, the theme uh, song be for 2024 and why? Yeah, my, my theme song for, for 2024 um, would be Yesterday to the Beatles, but I... I I wrote uh, a, a couple of different lyrics for it. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll treat, I suppose, is a word that I could use, the audience to my singing voice. <clears throat> Yesterday, all my data was not far away. And now it looks as though it's cloud to stay. Oh, I believed in yesterday. Suddenly, my data is where it's supposed to be, but I have to pay a compute fee. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. Why we had to go, well, I know, but cannot say. We breached something bad, now I long for yesterday. <laughs> So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good rendition. And I like that choice of the Beatles. Very good. Very good. And I don't know. We didn't ask that everybody needed to sing. So um, I will take the other two respondents off the hook. So Nicole. Um, what would your choice of the theme song be for 2024? Well, I don't think it's fair that I have to follow Mark, to be honest. <laughs> I was debating on getting ChatGPT to write me something, but then I realized I don't have a singing <laughs> voice, so that wasn't going to happen. Um, so anyways, this is the song that I picked. I'm going to just play you a snippet from it, and then I'll explain a little <laughs> bit behind my choice. I'm Except it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. Or the time will be changing. So Bob Dylan wrote that song in 1963 That's as an one. anthem. Pardon? Sorry? So he wrote that as an anthem to change. So nope. go right ahead. I have found it kind of poetically appropriate, to be honest, in this age of data and just how things are changing. Um, I know it hasn't happened overnight, you know, how we collect, use and analyze and discuss data it has changed how we do business in the last decade. So, you know, only in the last few years though, the world has started to take notice. I think back to like the Cambridge Analytica scandal a decade ago, or the huge uptake in generative AI really just this last year. And data is not really just for math nerds anymore. <laughs> so it's moved from a niche skill or industry into the mainstream. Um, so honestly, how we explore, understand and communicate with data will become as necessary an ability as reading literacy and numeracy. And as Bob Dylan says toward the end of the song, your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a changing. Very good. I like that one. Very good choice. Very good choice. All right. So we had a sing and then a play. And Laura, do you want to share what your theme song would be? So yesterday and times they are a changing. We have some time orientation here. What about you? Well, it's funny that you noticed that pattern, Wendy. Let me just see if I can play it here. I hope you got that. <laughs> Let's get it started. Let's get it started. Yeah. So I I uh, agree with the observations uh, that Nicole and Mark made with their songs that uh, we we 
have to change and we have to change because otherwise we're going to be kind of stuck in the past. And I, I've now been thinking uh, a lot about data literacy for the past almost five years. And I, I haven't seen a lot of movement within the organizations that I've been part of during that time. I, I think it's great that Dataversity has this series because I think it, it, data literacy is something that needs to be understood, reinforced, and and evolved, right? At both at the organizational and the and the individual level. Uh, so I'm kind of impatient to like move it forward, and that's why I chose this song. I hadn't previously listened to all of the lyrics. Uh, I only had the chorus in my head. Uh, so I didn't play the first verse, <laughs> which if you guys know the song probably wouldn't have been appropriate for the <laughs> webinar, but I do like the, <laughs> I do like the, uh, the impatience in the, and the excitement actually in the chorus. So. Yes, I, I like that too. And if any of you out there listening in, all of the attendees have a perfect song to recommend, you know, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll take a look later and. Uh, comment on any of those. So we look forward to hearing from all of you as well. So let's move on to the uh, first serious question, although I, I don't know that, that that is not serious to hear about where we think we're going and um, how much we think we need to change and how much we need to actually um, move forward because you haven't seen Laura a whole lot of um, movement, even in the last five years. So let's go to the second question. And I will uh, start with Nicole. And um, the question that I wanted to pose first is, what trends do you see in 2024 um, that would make it the year that companies will actually be able to make these kinds of changes, the kinds of changes that Laura would like to see. So Nicole, why don't you start us off here? Sure. Um, well, to be honest, I don't think that there will be any of these like big advancements or major changes in data literacy, but I do think that this snowball will continue to grow and gain momentum. You know, companies just, they just seem to always be drawn to these, like these quick wins, these big shakeups. They want everything to change so fast. But I think that investing in something that is a slower burn, like improving data literacy, which really is a long game, it's harder for companies because it takes years to see the results, right? So, you know, when we think to like reading literacy, that starts with learning the alphabet, not learning, not reading Charles Dickens's great expectations, you know? Um, right. But I do think there are three areas where I, I feel like there will be advancements in the next year or so. Um, first, I think data storytelling. Um, more people are interested in learning how to properly communicate data insights, right? So communication has unfortunately just been a challenge in the data and analytics world for a very long time. But I think we're finally starting to get to this point where we can communicate some of these challenges more effectively without resorting to like tech speak and alienating a bunch of people. Um, I also think that our educational institutions, right from grade school through to post-secondary, they're starting to recognize this gap in data literacy training. Um, you know, companies have been saying they need more data literate employees. And, and I think finally, these institutions of ours are starting to listen over the last several years. So I think that 2024 will continue this snowball effect with graduates entering the workforce, and they'll keep pushing companies to improve the data culture and how data is used. So I think it, it will start, we'll start seeing more results because of the snowball effect. And then, I mean, I don't think any conversation would be complete without talking about the fact that, you know, the generative AI advancements we've seen in the last year alone will force companies to fast track what they wanted to do for data literacy in, in 2024, right from the top down in companies. You know, we, we can't discuss these concepts like how to use AI in the office, whether AI will replace jobs or the ethical, of use, ethical use of AI and data without first understanding how to explore, understand, and communicate with data. So like I said, not anything like major, but I think the snowball has started and we're gonna start seeing improvements. Great. 
So storytelling and uh, advances in education so that we accelerate that. And then also um, how AI is going to have an influence on that. Yeah, I think so. That's great. Um, So let me start... um, Turn now to Laura. Laura, can you give us your thought on trends and especially think about whether you agree that these are going to be incremental um, steps forward, not a big leap the way that it sounds like Nicole thought about it? Yeah, so first of all, I I appreciate the response that Nicole gave, especially about data storytelling and educational institutions. I know when I've when I've read up on data literacy, there is so much really good work that's been done in in uh, elementary level and high school level, like trying to raise awareness of the need for this. Um, I when I was thinking through this, the the thing that popped to my mind was the last thing that Nicole mentioned, which is, with the advancement of AI, we are really, we actually have the potential, I think, for a giant leap forward, not just an incremental leap. Um, and the reason that I think about it this way is that we all know what's happened in the last year with AI. Suddenly it seems real and it had not seemed quite real before. And we all recognize that it has the potential to be a a, a real game changer, uh, but there is a ton of uncertainty around it, and people are aware of the risks, per- perhaps more aware of the risks than they are of the opportunities. So one of the ways to reduce the uncertainty around the use of AI is to actually study and understand the data itself and what data is going in into uh, these you know algorithms and such. So that is only going to come about if people really hone their data literacy skills and build their knowledge. So there are both positive and negative drivers to that, right? The positive driver is the opportunity and the negative driver is the risk that things can go wrong. The other thing that I think is gonna happen when people explore AI more is that they're gonna see, it's gonna make them curious, more curious about data, right? They're gonna wanna know more about the data because uh, they're gonna see it in action in a different way from how they have seen it uh, before. So I'll just reference here the executive order that uh, the Biden administration issued at the end of uh, 2023, near the end of 2023. When I read that, I was very interested that it acknowledges uh, both the risk of uh, AI creating greater social inequality, the risk of AI putting national security uh, in you know, at risk in the U.S. and other places, and also the opportunity that AI could really uh, change how we interact and how we advance on uh, other aspects of social opportunity. So both the the kind of things we're afraid of and the things that we're hoping for, and I think that for me that encompassed. Uh, the range, the spectrum of things we can do with AI. And it also made me realize that if people want to be engaged, they, you know, they're going to have to learn more about the data and how it comes together uh, in order to meet both the opportunities and the risks. All right. So Laura believes that there may be some bigger leaps because of how people are responding to the AI advancements, both because people might be afraid of it, but also because there are opportunities and it makes people more curious. So I I think that's a wonderful perspective. And I think there's a lot of places where people believe that AI is going to have an effect. And so uh, in your opinion, it's going to have an impact on data literacy efforts um, in all of these ways. Indeed. Yep. So, um, so then, 
Mark, why don't you finish us off on these trends? And again, a comment on whether you think that this is the snowball incrementally growing over time versus some leaps that might be um, potentially happening in the near term. So give us an answer, but also um, comment on that. So this is uh, something I've been thinking about for a while, and and I'm seeing the trend more and more. And uh, just talking to folks at at, at events like uh, DGIQ and EDW, um, I, I see um, companies that are engaging in data mesh or data fabric type activities. Uh, so uh, folks who are federating their architecture and uh, and doing federated models. And Wendy, we talked a bit about this not too long ago as well. Yeah. Um, you, you've got this federated architecture and federated way of being such that folks around your organization must be more literate to survive. It's like literacy trial by fire or literacy uh, by immersion, um, where people are required to across the organization to manage their silo, to manage their data product, um, to be more and more literate than they ever have been before. Um, and there's a lot of research right now on mesh and fabric. And I think Gartner said not too long ago, the mesh is dead, mesh is dead. And and maybe to some sense it is, but uh, fabric isn't. And, and they're very similar concepts. They're just slightly different architectural bends on the same thing. You're trying to federate something and and spread the the data love throughout the organization and who's managing everything but it's going to require that so many people be more literate to 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 make that function so i think it's uh it, it has to happen um uh in that direction I, i'm actually if anybody's following along with uh the cool kids articles i'm actually writing about uh this in my cool kids uh column on which will be published on monday uh so just the nature of the federated model but folks having to be storytellers and data managers um, in that in that federation, or else things just don't work. Uh, so it it creates a requirement where a requirement wasn't as broad before. Right. So yours is almost a structural um, imperative. So you're saying that as a result of how structure and architecture is evolving, it will put some requirements. Um, on a wider variety of people to become experts in the data that belong in their area is exactly. kind of what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Well, this is a nice uh, variety of answers from the grassroots need to get better at some of these things to the effect of an external um, development that is being imposed on people, whether they are ready or not, and then the structural um, different causes. So those are a nice variety of answers for our audience to really think about in what's going to happen. So um, can we move on to the next question? And I will start with uh, Laura. Um, in this spirit of a fresh start, which was the title of this uh, particular webinar, in what ways should companies change their thinking? So we just talked about changes in actual events or structures or trainings or outside influences like AI that is sort of appeared through chat GPT and others. How should they change their thinking to help jumpstart what's happening? Yeah, so I I like this question a lot because I do think that there is a, na a need to change how how we think about the the purpose of data literacy. So one of the problems that I see is that organizations tend to think about data literacy and other data management problems in really similar ways. They're not thinking about how can how can we make value the question that you raised instead they they are trying to think oh how do we prove that we have somehow implemented a data literacy problem uh, a data literacy uh program without necessarily thinking about the goals of that program 
and I see similar things in data quality. Oh, we have to profile our data. Well, why do you want to profile your data? What are you trying to learn? I don't know. We just need to profile it. They said the tool would take care of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, until organizations actually um, actually define the problems they in particular need to solve, they they may just be adopting ideas around data literacy without really having drivers for those ideas. And I think that needs to change. They need to understand their current state and they need to understand what, uh, how to get to a better future state. Um, the second thing, which is a kind of subset of that problem is that there has been a lot, a lot more focus on tooling than I would have thought for this subject. Um, because data literacy is really not about tooling, although tooling can support how we share knowledge around data, but it's really about how you change your culture and you help the people that comprise that culture uh, learn more about data and develop the skills they need to, to use data better. So uh, Nicole had said earlier that uh, data literacy is a long game. And that, that I think is really true. Uh, you know, you've got to invest time in helping the organization as a whole and the individuals uh, actually learn. So I, I think the final comment I want to make is that while data literacy is, needs to be supported by organizational processes, there's also a risk that for individuals, they may perceive themselves as not data people. <laughs> and if if they think that way about themselves, if they think, oh, you know, there's people that can learn about data or already know about data, and I'm not one of those people, then that will be a huge obstacle for both them as individuals and for um, the organization. So one uh, I think, there's two things to get around this obstacle, right? One is to really uh, encourage people to adopt a growth mindset, right? Help them understand that they can learn and then and then actually get them excited about learning. And then uh, the second thing is what I mentioned earlier, which is actually building people's curiosity about data. I know uh, I, I, um, find data completely fascinating. <laughs> uh, so when I think when we talk about data, if we can do so in a way that gets people curious about it instead of intimidated by it, then we can uh, we can uh, make advancements. So I think a you know a new start involves uh, thinking about the problems you're trying to solve and then really trying to engage people in a different way so that they are excited about solving those problems and they're, and they're interested in the answers that they can get from data. Well, those are some really good points. So um, number one, the purpose behind it rather than just doing it. So why, why might an organization be interested in improving literacy and, and how does that shape what we do? Also shifting from tools and metrics to culture. Uh, I think that's a wonderful one. And then I like this uh, shifting our thinking on how we label ourselves. Uh, and I, I do think that that is one of the big challenges for, for how we help somebody who doesn't believe they are a quote unquote data person, a math person. Um, how do we help them get curious as you put it and help them really get interested in a way uh, that they want to achieve that kind of growth. Wow. And they, they look forward to that. So uh, wonderful um, thoughts about that. Anything else, Laura? That's all I have on that one, but I'd be curious okay. to, to, I'm curious to hear the other responses. Yes, okay. So Mark, um, what about you? How should we be yeah. changing our thinking? Well, Laura said a lot of things that I agree with, but. But one thing that um, I've had a few discussions with folks on this now, um, and I see it coming up in the chat too. So I love that our chat is so vibrant. Um, when we call things data literacy, then we call people illiterate. Uh, you still have the same issue with fluency and you're not fluent. 
um, affluent. <laughs> I don't think that's that's not the right <laughs> word. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I, I I think the true nature of 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 these labels and and how we approach data literacy uh, is a little bit. I think we're to blame a little bit for this, uh, which is maybe a bit of a hot take. I the way we as data management professionals and data leaders treat folks who don't understand might be part of the problem here. Um, and I think it requires a much gentler hand. And And why I really like Laura's answer is we want to encourage that curiosity in folks. We want to encourage people uh, to have fun with and learn about data. Um, um, but not couch it in terms of, well, you don't know anything, so let me help you along the way. Like, I, it, it's, I, I think, I think we share and shoulder some of this this blame uh, as to why folks at at the C suite aren't as engaged as they should be. Um, and and you see the the the, the symptom of this is you see a, a lack of understanding of requirements when it comes to fixing the quarterly report in the end like really what is data literacy is fixing the quarterly report i think you know, that's a bit of a joke but i mean it's true right like what are we fixing why are we fixing it what do you think it is that and and wendy it goes to a lot of what you and i talk about and what what you've talked about over the last year in this series is the analytic translator, somebody who can bridge the gap between data and business. I, I think that's where the secret sauce lies. Um, and, and communication has to be more respectful both ways. And I think, I think we as data management folks can take a lot of that on ourselves and speak in more business terms. So that that's the kind of, direction and change in thinking that I've been thinking about for data literacy for the last couple of months. Yes. And uh, thanks for that plug for uh, anybody interested, <laughs> analytic-translator.com. Um, we are uh, trying to train a thousand people, hopefully, to change all of this. Uh, so uh, McKinsey says we need two million more translators um, by the end of the decade. So. Um, I agree, obviously, with that, um, and I think that your um, perspective really does um, synergize with what Laura was talking about on how we self-label, and I agree with you that uh, how we approach that, and that's probably part of Laura's culture, uh, really can make a difference. And so, Nicole, I know they've covered a lot of topics. Um, I'm curious what you think we ought to change uh, with the way that we think about literacy. Yeah, I, I can't say I disagree with anything that was said, to be honest, especially what um, Mark just said now about, you know, the fact that we can have this judgmental attitude towards people who don't know data. To be honest, I think in the past, anyways, like when I've, I've been doing this for, you know, most of my adult life, I'm um, not going to tell you how old I am, but that's a long time. <laughs> and, you know, in the early days, I think that bit of an ego was a bit more to be taken seriously, you know, that my skills are useful, that you need my skills, that my job is useful. I have switched a long time ago to being more of a teacher and a mentor to people who are not the most data literate. So trying to take them on a journey in terms of, you know, you called it a growth mindset, Laura, I call it a building a data mindset. And to me, a data mindset is just, um, you know, you look at a problem and ideas from multiple perspectives, and then you just integrate data into all the elements of your thought and decision process. So you, you're, you're just open-minded and you ask questions like, well, what's really going on? Why is it like that? You know, where's the proof? It's not about the math. Like I know I was reading an article recently about marketing people and how they have math anxiety, right? And they think that it's all about numbers and you have to be a numbers nerd to like data. But, you know, when you ask your waiter and you say, what's good, the chicken or the beef, and they give you some feedback, that's technically data helping you make your decision, right? So you just have to, you have to be more open-minded in terms of how you approach people who aren't um, in the data professional field, because everybody uses data to a certain extent. So I, I definitely liked that idea of being more open and being less judgmental. Um, other thing I just really wanted to touch on too that Laura had said was, I really don't like this idea that 
companies think that data literacy starts with this new tech or this new tool. You know, no one, no one will take a shovel to a pile of dirt and assume that it will plant the seeds and grow the garden, right? So <laughs> yeah, we think that we're going to get this new data warehouse, this new data visualization tool, and data insights will just magically appear. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't think about that when we think of a shovel. So why do we think of that when we buy, you know, a new piece of tech or a new tool, right? So, I mean, obviously we still need data professionals. We need people to analyze the data, find the insights, but then also communicate to the audience in a way that's respectful and that gets you that measurable value, right? Because that's really what we're going for. Um, the other thing that nobody really touched on that I really personally think it's a huge misconception is when you look at job descriptions for anything in the data world, it's always about these hard skills. Can you do Python? Can you query with SQL? Can you build a statistical model? And I mean, these can be essential skills depending on the organization, but that's not the starting point for developing real true data literacy in organizations. Because I mean, you can hire the most technical data scientist or analyst who has the most modern tools, but that doesn't make your team data literate because they might be great at exploring the data, but who knows if they have good communication skills to speak to their insights that will help with data informed decision making. Or maybe the audience still believes in gut feel and intuition. So any results they present will just fall on deaf ears anyways. Right. So and then my final thought also is that this idea that data literacy starts with individual contributors. I personally don't think it does. I think there's tons of people out there just looked at look at on LinkedIn. Everybody's getting a certificate in data something or other these days. I personally think that we need to start with the top. We need to start with the leadership and we have to start, as Laura mentioned, with the problems we're trying to solve. Not the fact that I have this, these terabytes of information and data at my disposal. It's, but what do I want to solve with this information? What is my problem? What, what do I need? How do I need this company to move forward? And I just, I don't think that um, the way we approach data literacy right now um, from the bottom up is necessarily the best way. Yeah. So if, if I was to summarize my thinking, I just wish companies would stop thinking of data literacy as tools or hard skills because they can be bought or trained, to be honest. If we approach problems with the right data mindset, that's the foundation. And if employees right from the C-suite down to the individual contributors don't have the right data mindset, then companies will struggle to build a data litter organization no matter how many tools they buy or training courses they send their staff on. Yeah. Yeah, I do have to say, I, I love all three of your perspectives. And Nicole, I think you are spot on. And I'm seeing a ton of uh, comments about how um, what you're saying resonates with people. And so you wonder whether we even, if we're talking about language, do we really want to even use the word data? Because it freaks so many people out. Um, so why are we even thinking about it as a data issue when it's more about understanding or producing value or some of these other things. And might we think about it differently if somebody doesn't put a data hat on it or a number hat on it, because that's where everybody with math phobia instantly goes. Yeah. So wonderful comments to all of you. So there is one more question that uh, I would like each of you to comment on. And I will start with you, Mark. Um, if there is something, and we've heard a whole variety of comments already about where people ought to go and what we ought to stop doing and what we ought to start doing. Um, but I'd ask you to prioritize. If there's somebody today who's saying, okay, it's the beginning of 2024, and I need to start somewhere because this is in my KPIs. This is what I need to be producing. I need to help with literacy, whether it's the literacy mindset or the literacy abilities or a literacy culture. What is the one thing that you would recommend that somebody do right now? Yeah, this is, this is something I've had success with. Um, at, at the last several places that I've I've uh, worked at and and I recommend everybody do something uh, in this vein and and really it's about communication but uh, what I've enjoyed doing is newsletters 
um, hey, this is what's new in data. This is what's new in data in our organization. This is what the data team's working on. This is why it's cool. Uh, and and really just bite-sized, entertaining chunks um, of, of newsletter type content. Uh, the last place that I, I did this at, um, you had, a, <laughs> I used to put like two short paragraph size articles and then like a, a, a food recipe at the end because I like to pretend I can cook. And and so I'd get the occasional person. Yeah, like I look at the news. I really, I'm really just there for the recipe. It was always page two. But eventually what I started hearing was folks talking about the topic, uh, uh, the data topic of the day, whether that be AI or, or a master data management initiative or something. But it was always written in the style that would be, hey, this is why this matters at our organization. This is why it's, it's important for everybody. Uh, uh, so that's sort of a, a vibe. But maintaining a, 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 a good communication strategy a uh, fun communication strategy that has a, a regular cadence to it uh, so that people can expect something, whether it's like a short 30 second or two minute video that you do on Tuesdays and you do like two minute Tuesdays that I've heard people do before. Uh, anything like that um, is, is going to help move the needle, even though it's a small thing. It's a small, tiny thing that you can just do. Um, and, and, you know, as long as people start thinking about data, um, you'll have success with something like that. Yeah. So it's a fun, regular communication tidbit that uh, highlights things that are um, either intriguing or useful so that people get used to seeing examples that maybe they haven't thought of as a quote unquote data example or a literacy example. Exactly. Yeah, that that's really great. So Nicole, if you had to select one thing that should be on their minds to advance literacy in 2024, what would it be? Well, for me, um, I wouldn't start, obviously, with buying a new tool or sending off an employee. <laughs> I personally would start with training the leaders to be data literate. Um, in particular, I would focus on getting the right champions in the organization who can truly affect change, especially I've, I've worked with some people who are like, yeah, yeah, no, we totally need to do this. But then after the meeting, it, it doesn't really go anywhere, right? Or that champion goes away and then nobody takes their place and then everything just falls apart in the organization. So it really needs to start from the top and kind of then trickle into the rest of the culture, because I think so many organizations think that it's the individual contributors who need to be data literate first. But in my experience, I've just found that if I didn't have good, solid leadership and a champion, then everything that I was trying to bring that was a value just never worked out properly because the data culture, unfortunately, starts at the top. You know, I know that grassroots movements tend to be favored and there's I don't know why, but this kind of disdain for a hierarchical structure sometimes. But I think when organizations are, are structured hierarchically without support from the top, there's just a good chance that any new programs or ideas will fail. And so if organization leaders are brought into the program first, then, then they've got more of a fighting chance to succeed. Um, and just kind of what, what, what um, to echo what Mark was saying in terms of making things fun, like one of the things I've tried to do when I've been an employee in organizations is to be relatable to people to make sure that I'm around, that I talk to people, that they realize that we're not off to the side and we're separate, we're a separate group, that you collaborate with people, that you bring them into your work, they bring you into their work, and then involve the leaders in all of that stuff, give them, you know, a lunch and learn type thing. But I always like to make sure that leaders are involved in all of the processes when it comes to implementing data changes in organizations. Got it. So you are an advocate for starting at the top in some ways. It doesn't mean exclusively at the top. Yeah, definitely not yeah. exclusively. <laughs> right, right. But but the leaders need to understand what they're trying to achieve because if they think it's going to come from the bottom up and then the individual contributors aren't meeting their their needs, they have to think, well, what are my needs in the first place? Like they need to define that. So right. I do think that in a large case, yes, we need to train everybody, but I think that the change needs to start at the top. Yes. So it's partly modeling because they would be modeling a behavior that they hope the rest of the company would adopt. Yes. And then partly awareness so that 
they understand what other people are going through, um, yeah. especially okay. if they are having to learn. Um, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great, uh, that's a great step. So we've got um, fun, regular communication that uh, helps build groundswell of awareness and, and has it um, data issues and data learnings becoming a part of the, I'll, I'll use the word fabric, even though that isn't how the, you use fabric exactly, um, Mark. And then also um, an adoption by the, the leadership so that they are aware and modeling these issues. Um, and so let's uh, ask you, Laura, um, if there was one thing you think that companies could do right now, what would it be? Yeah, so what I had thought through before, this is very similar to uh, what Nicole was talking about. Um, I'm gonna tie it back to a comment I made earlier about curiosity and getting people engaged in thinking about data. So I think if there's one thing that companies can do, it is to start to, to use data themselves in a way that, in, that employees get engaged and, and uh, to bring that into the, the culture of the company. And obviously that needs to happen among leadership and it also can happen among other people as well. So when I talk about getting people excited or getting them curious about data, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm, I think there's lots of ways of being curious and it can be that you find it fun or interesting. I know I've found data really interesting, but I think the way that you can change the organization is if you make that direct connection to the business goals. So the point that you made to introduce the uh, webinar, Wendy, is you know business leaders want value. And so if you can show how the data itself allows you to understand the value that the business is generating and the data then contributes to that, uh, that can be very powerful. And I'll give an example. Um, I've been fortunate to to work in several companies where leadership has been very good with data and has used data themselves to demonstrate how we've been improving or changing the business. Um, and the example I'll give is during the pandemic, I work for a healthcare company. And as you guys can imagine, uh, the, the events of the pandemic had a lot of different effects on the business of the company, right? Uh, large employers were were uh, you know furloughing or laying people off. So the way that that affected uh, monthly reporting and the way that it affected the types of claims that came in and everything, it was just you know potentially chaotic if people did not have a handle on the data. And so our data science team uh, put together some uh, analyses and and particularly good visuals that showed how the pandemic was changing our business and how we needed to get ahead of that in order to both serve our customers and understand what might be happening from a financial and, uh, and other points of view. And so to me, that was a major illustration of why we needed to have good reliable data because otherwise we would not have been able to navigate the, the maelstrom of the pandemic. So you can't always have examples that are that vivid, but right. if you if you focus on having examples that show that connection between how we understand the business through data and how we make decisions about what to do in the business, I think that that is the most powerful thing that can change people's perceptions of of their own relationship to data. Um, so I say examples, examples, examples. <laughs> yes. Yeah, th that's a really, really great point. And I'll, I'll add another example along that line. In a previous life, in my work in human capital, we did a lot of work on pay for performance and adjusting compensation for all workers to reflect what they are accomplishing. 
And I will tell you that once you give somebody a metric and say, this is how your job links to your department, and this is how your department links to the performance of the organization. And so these are your goals because this is how it links with a line of sight to how the organization is doing. So we are going to partly pay you based on your achievement of these metrics. And I will tell you that people get very curious (laughs) and very (laughs) intent on understanding whether those metrics are valid, whether they are um, uh, distributed reasonably, whether there are outliers that don't make sense, whether they should be used to make comparisons. So there are great ways that you can start to think about uh, measures that get people a little more uh, attached, essentially, to understanding. So, uh, but that was a great example, Laura. So um, I think we are down to the last couple of minutes and we do have a question. Um, and and uh, Shannon, I'll just go ahead and, and ask this question. And uh, it's uh, the an anonymous attendee asked, um, how do you see data literacy advocacy in 2024 um, in a way that averts the pitfalls of being data literate or fluent and versus not? And how do we advocate for data literacy without uh, forgetting the less data oriented people? So we've touched on that a little bit. Um, but uh, Nicole, why don't I just go ahead and throw that one over to you? Um, based on some of the comments you made, um, how do we advocate for it in a way that um, uh, does not uh, highlight people who are non-experts and call them out? You know what, to be honest, um, I don't think uh, too many people use the phrase data literacy or data fluency outside of the, the data sphere, unless you're talking to data people. I know when I've worked in especially larger organizations, but definitely smaller startups as well, I've never been, I've never thrown around the terms, you know, are you data literate? Are you data fluent? I just start talking to them and I just start asking questions and then you kind of get an idea of where they're at and what they need. So I think that even, even using the terminology, like, I mean, we use the terms literacy and numeracy, although to be honest, um, I don't even know how many people use the term numeracy anymore because it's, I think a lot of people call it number sense and stuff like that. So if the terms make people uncomfortable, we don't necessarily need to use the terms to train the skill in all honesty. That's, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, what we don't, it, it's sort of like going back to the beginning where I introduced this topic. Um, just like companies don't care whether their people are data literate, um, except to the point that it helps them perform better as an organization and helps people be successful. And I think you're right. We don't, the the individual doesn't care and doesn't really identify themselves as literate or not, but they have a certain level of comfort and we might be able to help them differently if we're not um, identifying it in that way. I mean, to Mark's point, it's just a, a way to, we can engage their curiosity while being respectful and not using terminology that might, might make them be more self-conscious about what they know or what they don't know. Yes. Uh, Any additional comment on that topic, Laura? So I, over the last year, I've been humbled by people who have talked to me about this because uh, I, it never occurred to me personally that using the term literacy would, that people would take it the opposite way and be concerned about illiteracy. But I've had several conversations with people that I really respect on this, and they have made that observation that, you know, the term can get in the way. So I agree with what Nicole said about, you know, we don't want to use, and Mark, we don't want to use terminology that's going to get in the way. At the same time, I think it is helpful to have models of literacy because you 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 don't have to have everybody be an expert in data uh, to contribute to a data-driven organization, but you need people to be comfortable enough and to have the right skills and knowledge for the the work that they need to do so that they feel confident in making connections. And so I think the concept of literacy 
can be applied to data to create models of how we of the things that people need to to learn or to know and the ways that they can gain knowledge and experience about data. But we don't necessarily need to put those up front and say, this is this is a test, you have to pass it. Um, instead, we need to use them to help people get to the place that they need to be and to help organizations get more value from their data. Great, great answer. So I know we're running out of time. We're at the top of the hour, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. uh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and uh, we will be getting, for those of you who asked about the Biden um, uh, declaration about AI, then uh, Laura, uh, you if you can provide a, a link to that, um, then uh, we can send that out when we send out um, information. Sure. Yep, I would it. be glad to. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Wendy, as always. And thank you to our guest panelists today for such a great conversation. Um, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording with and with that additional link and information as well. Well, thank you all. Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, we will see you in more webinars. Have a great, great. day. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Thanks Wendy. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nicole, Laura. Mark.